Let's see. All right. So while we're on the topic of um, things that are going to get me placed in jail, uh, I'm <laughs> Dr. Bill Beckerman from Rutgers. Uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, almost like I knew this was coming, these are my disclaimers. Pretty much everything I'll be talking about is off-label. So sort of speaking about you know, where we are now, this was the state of complex EVOR in 2012. You had your standard bifurcated devices for your juxta renals, four millimeter necks or more. You had Zfen. Everything else, nothing. 2023, we have the addition of endo anchors for the four millimeter plus necks and everything else, nothing. So I think the FDA sort of has to understand that the patients aren't going away and they're not getting healthier for open surgery. And there's not a whole lot of Dr. Schneider's rolling around with uh, IDEs. So the patients, especially ones who are coming in symptomatic, need to be treated. So what are our options? You know, open or debranching, of course. Uh, it's been around for a bit. The trial devices, you know, the Tambi is probably closest to market. Zfen Plus, which is going into trials, but only if you have access. Uh, parallel grafting, which Mosin's going to talk about shortly. PMEGs and in situ laser fenestration. So in situ laser fenestration was probably popularized by Dr. Halan, probably mispronouncing his name, uh, coming out of France. And it describes intentional endograph coverage of target vessels, followed by laser perforation of the fabric and the deployment of the bridging stent. Uh, I had a very good 2018 paper describing this. Uh, in the US, uh, the mantle is probably taken over by Dr. Han, uh, not this one, the one at California, um, who has a IDE and has actually published a, a good case series, or uh, I guess actually technically a manuscript, where for his symptomatic and ruptures, he's basically gone away from PMEG and is now, if you look at the chart at the your bottom left, uh, almost entirely in favor of in situ laser fenestrations for his symptomatic patients. So the cases to consider it and the ones that I do it, um, I do not have access to uh, any trial devices. I do do PMEG, I do do snorkels, I do do uh, in situ laser. Um, urgent or emergent thoracoabdominal or abdominal aortic aneurysm cases necessitating branch coverage. You can use it in the arch. People do it. I personally do not. Um, poor candidates for PMEG due to urgency or other factors or poor candidates for open surgery. People have been turned down for trial devices. Cases to avoid, or at least the ones that I strongly think about avoiding in situ laser fen, uh, sort of to the point about you know, how you don't want your stents to be bridging large aneurysms. If there's a large diameter around your target vessel where your stent is traversing more than you know, five, six millimeters or so, um, I would try to avoid it because, again, the covered stents are unsupported along the bridge portion, and they don't even have the benefit of the little ring of support that we use when we sew a PMEG on there. Um, extreme tortuosity makes things very difficult, uh, at least if you're having some trouble getting your sheath right below where you need to go. Severe caudal vessel orientation makes things tough, at least from below, in which case you can use upper arm access. Severe tapering of the aorta is also a challenge, and this is something that I learned the hard way. Um, if you have a aortic stent graft where you're sealed up above and then you have to taper down to your visceral portion, your fabric is bunching up and your stent forms get closer together. And it becomes very difficult to either burn a hole through the fabric or to get your stent in there without a severe waste. Um, another one I learned the hard way is for the morbidly obese and the people who are very, very horizontal. Um, when you need true lateral projections to not burn a hole in a patient's aorta, um, if you can't see your target stent, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, so I had a patient, I pre-stented them, I went for my lateral view, couldn't see it. <laughs> I went to my other room, the OR love this, took a lateral view, couldn't see it, and had to convert to a parallel graph for that patient. So just something to keep in mind so you don't upset the OR like I did. Um, so the planning of this, you know, again, this is not the kind of planning that you're typically gonna need for a PMEG. These are often urgent cases, you're not debating clock phases and stuff, but it still requires a fair amount of planning. You need to know the length of aortic coverage, the diameter of the aorta in your seal zone, and pick out your graph based on this. Um, people have talked about doing laser fen for PTFE graphs, for your gore graphs, um, but I think even they don't like doing it. Um, I typically relegate myself to the polyester graphs, your Terumos, your Cooks, your Medtronics. You need to know your target vessel diameters and your stent lengths. To save time and radiation, going in knowing your gantry angles is gonna be very helpful. 
and any access concerns or you know, laterality issues. For the equipment, and again, this is just the way I do it. There are multiple uh, sequences and series and you know, devices that are used. Um, the target stents, um, I use Medtronic Visipro. Some people talk about using VBXs. Bridging stents, pretty much just the VBXs. For the angulation, for the laser fen, as well as for the pre-stenting, I basically have a seven French or sometimes an 8.5 French uh, tour guide uh, sheath within a 12 French dry seal sheath. This system is important because if you have a very tortuous iliac or very calcified iliac, as you're trying to rotate your tour guide, it's going to get messed up. Um, it really does not like those real tortures, real calcified iliacs, and I think I killed like two or three tour guides during one case before I figured this out. Uh, laser catheter, uh, there's a couple different brands. I use the Spectronetics Turbo Elite 2 uh, millimeter. That is the one for an 018 wire. Uh, exchange catheter angled, I use the Truman Navacross. 018 starting wire, I like to use metal only wires just so I don't potentially burn a uh, covered portion of a wire. I think that's more theoretical, but it's just what I do. Working wire for the uh, end of ballooning and stent placement, a rosin. And for my sequence, and again, some people have simplified this, uh, rapid exchange 018 balloons, four millimeters then a five millimeter cutting, and then I finish it off with a eight to 10 millimeter uh, proximal flared balloon. Um, so the overhead arm support is very, very useful, uh, both for improving visualization as well as reducing radiation. Uh, you can, if you need to, get brachial access if you need to come from above with this. And this is a lot better than put, putting arms on like pillows and stuff with silk tape, which again, the anesthesiologist really loved when I first started before I got this. Fusion, if possible, will help you. Again, I know not always possible in a true emergent situation, depending on how things are. Um, this is actually something I learned from Dr. Farries. Um, the way he does a carotid stent is the way that I have things arranged for the fenestration portion of the case. Um, once you cover the visceral vessels and the renals with your AREC stent graft, your ischemic timer goes off, and then any delay, like running to get something from another room or figuring out you're missing this, you're ischemic. And it's you know, obviously an issue. So I actually stack the equipment in the order I'm going to be using it. So if my scrub tech changes or if I'm with a resident that hasn't done a lot, it should hopefully be about as idiot proof as possible. Again, nothing is actually idiot proof. You can always invent a better idiot, but it keeps things at least to a minimum of decision making and possible ways to mess things up. Uh, you do need a team comfortable with endovascular. If you're trying to do this in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., it's rough. Um, calibrate the laser fiber before you place the aortic graft, so again, you're not worrying about ischemic time. And if your patient is not ruptured or unstable, I have fairly liberal ACTs, again, because you're covered. Um, so how I do it, uh, following the large bore femoral access, I pre-stent the target vessels. Some people will use only fusion for this. Uh, I'm not as comfortable, and my team's not as comfortable with purely doing this. Steerable sheath through the 12 French, parked as high as possible, and use the short, uh, highly visible stents. Do not flare them into the aorta, because if you do, there's a chance that they can get wrapped around your aortic stent graft when they get placed in there. Once you're done, if you want to take a quick look and register the angles, you're going to be looking at your stents straight on. Saves you a little bit of time when you're actually doing your laser fenestration. Make sure ACT is appropriately high. Now is the time to balloon your seal zone, because again, if you're at all close to your top or bottom edge, you don't want to be ballooning near where your unsupported uh, stents are. And then again, once your AREC stent graft is in, that's when your ischemic timer starts. Um, it seems like a few people have gone away from this, but I still try to do it in order of vessel importance, SMA, renal, renal, celiac, if I can. Using the laser catheter through your steerable sheath, you got to line everything up pretty much perfectly. You don't want to be off and be like, oh, maybe it'll, be, maybe it'll work. You want to see your laser fiber directly within your uh, Visi Pro or your target stent. Make sure to check this in multiple views. And once you're 100% sure that you're lined up, you can fire your laser at 60. Once you pop through, advance your wire. And then remove the laser catheter, uh, RX monorail balloon, take that out, exchange for Actually, sorry, a cutting balloon, then exchange for an 035 wire, stent with your VBX, flare it, and do that one, two, three, or four times. Uh, so a case example, uh, this is a 79-year-old male who came in symptomatic with a 6.2 type 4, maybe actually more of a type 5 thoracoabdominal aneurysm. 
So about half our patients are uh, fresh aneurysms, about half of them are uh, folks who've had prior endografts that usually have type 1A leaks. So initial aortogram uh, sort of shows the issue. Um, at the renals, it is pretty normal in size. Once you get to the celiac and SMA, it starts to uh, you know, get fairly aneurysmal. Uh, so for the pre-stenting portion, again, like I mentioned, 12 French uh, dry seal sheath you see down here, uh, steerable sheath uh, through that. And then you place your uh, Visipro stents. This is a little longer than what I typically use. Uh, this is one of my earlier cases. Let's see. Uh, so basically do this for all your vessels. Um, the shorter stents, especially in tortuous vessels, makes things easier to line up. You can imagine if you have a very long stent and it's very tortuous, it's a little tough to make sure you're exactly on the four uh, visible markers of what is the proximal portion. Because when you're lining up, you're lining up with, can you see my here? Yeah. You're lining up with here and obviously not here. So you also you have to be 100% sure you're aiming at the correct circle for this. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Uh, so again, repeat this for all your vessels. Um, Again, 99% of the time, uh, you can do this via purely femoral access, as Dr. Schneider showed, uh, because of the steerable sheaths that are you know, actually uh, very good now. Uh, you can see a true lateral is required, so you know, even on a skinny patient with the arms at the side, it's sometimes very tough to see the aorta, so arms above the head if at all possible. Uh, so here's our completion after the pre-stenting. Uh, I did a fairly aggressive celiac coiling, but just stopped short of the GDA. Uh, that was for saving of time, which I'm no longer doing. Um, after this, confirm the ACT prior to replacement of the aortic graft. Again, about 300 or so uh, if the patient's not ruptured or symptomatic. And again, then you start your laser fenestration. So you can see here, this is in your lateral projection, aiming at the SMA. Um, line it up. Again, you're going to be checking this in multiple projections. And once you know you're lined up, tap the pedal at 60, pop through, put out your wire. So following this is when you're going to use your uh, monorail balloon, then your cutting balloon, swap it out for an 035 wire, and then place your VBX, making sure that you're going into the aorta at least a few millimeters. Generally, I try to do two of the VBX stent forms so that you can minimize your risk of having a type 3 leak. Um, I think this is a 6 millimeter stent, and I, you know, I try to flare ideally no more than about 8 millimeters proximally. So. Again, this sort of rivets it into place. Obviously, it's not as good as if you would have a reinforced uh, fenestration, uh, like Dr. Stern showed for a PMEG. Uh, but again, in a pinch, if you don't have time to plan for your symptomatic or urgent patients, it does do the job. Uh, confirm your vessel patency. And then repeat this for all the vessels. So left renal. Sound effects are mine. Um, 018 balloon, uh, rapid exchange again, just because when your hole is the smallest, last thing I want to do is lose a wire, so it just makes things a little easier. Um, oftentimes, I'll forego the cutting balloon and just go uh, straight with one balloon and then the VBX stent. Um, but again, this was one of the earlier cases. Uh, your VBX and additionally your VisiPro should also be sized one to one with the target vessel. So this is, again, a little uh, proximal flaring with the 8-millimeter uh, uh, two balloon and a 6-millimeter VBX. And then this sort of shows what we're talking about. So this is actually when I actually uh, had the you know, presence of mind to capture one of these views. So you can see your VisiPro right there, and then your uh, end of the uh, steerable sheath uh, right within it. So again, if, you're, if you think you're close, if you think it's good enough, Stop, take another look. Not the time to be burning a hole through the graft and then into the aorta. So here again, we're maneuvering it around a little bit. You know, these are, you have to mag up a little bit. Hopefully you have some digital zoom. You can see how this could be an issue if you're with a fairly large patient. Um, make sure there's nothing sort of hanging underneath your table because again, you're gonna be going to frequent lateral and AP views and the last thing you wanna do is have a couple minutes go by when you're trying to like mess around with like EKG leads or something. So once you have the bullseye looking straight on, you know, rotate 90 degrees, so I do fire in this projection, 
And if you're still lined up after checking for the bullseye sign, fire the laser. Yeah, a little pop. And then 018 wire. And again, the steps again, which you probably don't need to see for a third time. Select a Vangio. Um, so uh, at that this point, do a completion of what should hopefully be the renal and visceral segments. Uh, again, to Dr. Stern's point, leaving plenty of room above and below for you know whatever graft is going to be next. Uh, for distal extension, I almost exclusively use the gore excluder, both because of the lack of suprarenal fixation, as well as for the short nose cone compared to other grafts. Last thing you want is to be using a device with a long nose cone that's going to, you know, potentially clip one of your unsupported stents. So finish in standard fashion. And completion. Uh, again, ideally completion from uh, AP and lateral. Uh, if you have the ability to do uh, on-table uh, spins, this is a good time for it. Uh, total ischemic time is generally going to be less than 60 minutes once you get a few of these under your belt. And most importantly, you're usually able to open up the SMA within about 10 minutes or so. So the ischemic time is generally not anything that's going to be prohibitive. Questions?